Canadian Mayher Ara is an innocent man. Yet based on unfounded suspicions, he was sent for 10 months of hell in a Syrian prison where he was tortured. Let me tell you something that happened during the interrogation. I urinated myself twice during the interrogation. I don't know what that shows, but my nerves, like, I can't control myself. I, I, it, it's so scary when you hear people being tortured. It's so scary when, when you are beaten. And I would just say anything, anything they want, just to stop the torture. Meher Ra was sent to Syria by United States government officials who believed he had information about terrorist suspects. Okay, I'll see you then. Ara's lawyers believe the US sent him for the purpose of interrogation under torture. They wanted to torture him, but they were, they didn't quite have the wherewithal, the guts, let's say, to do what they really intended to do was to torture this man. So they franchised the torture. They knew the Syrians wouldn't, wouldn't blink at torturing someone. And the purpose was, supposedly, to get information from him about his connections with al-Qaeda, which, by the way, are totally non-existent. Meher Ara is not the only case of what's known as extraordinary rendition a secretive US policy of outsourcing torture to countries like Syria and Egypt that's proving embarrassing and controversial for the US government. Ara was the first to sue the government over this practice, but last week, in a clear victory for the Bush administration, his case was thrown out of court. I think some of our clients uh are terrified of coming back to the United States and even though... Bill Goodman says this gives a green light for the government to continue with extraordinary rendition. If they can get away with doing it to Mayor Arar, they're, they're going to get away with doing it to whoever they choose to do it to, whether he be a non-citizen or a citizen, in my humble opinion, and or she, and that person will who's sent to Syria today can be sent to uh, the Sudan or Somalia tomorrow or uh, who knows where the next day. As we reported 18 months ago, Meher Ra's terrifying journey began in the summer of 2002, when he was detained while in transit at JFK Airport in New York. He was held here in a Brooklyn detention centre for two weeks, with little access to a lawyer. He was accused of being a member of Al-Qaeda and told he was to be deported. Not to Canada, but to Syria, the country of his birth. And I, I told him, I said, listen, you're going to send me to a country that you know does, has no, no law, has, they don't follow the law. And if you send me there, I'm going to be tortured. So I raised the torture issue many times. Despite his pleas and with no legal extradition process, Ara was put on board a Gulfstream jet. It's now known that these planes have been widely used in America's rendition program, taking detainees everywhere from Eastern Europe to the Middle East. Once in Syria, Meher Arar's worst fears were realised. They would basically put me back to the interrogation room and they would beat me again like three, four times with the cable. And now they started beating me on my shoulder, on my back, on my hips, on uh, mostly. And they would ask questions again. Sometimes they would beat first and then ask second. Ara says in Syria he was asked identical questions to those asked when he was detained in the US, leading him to believe that his Syrian interrogators were acting on behalf of the United States. And I asked the, the colonel actually, I said, you guys know I have nothing to do with uh, with any allegations the Americans did against me. Why don't you release me? And he said, yeah, you're going home very soon. Now, whether should I believe, I believe him or not, because they lied to me all the time, right? But you could, I could tell in their eyes that they had no interest in me. Syrian officials have since confirmed that they only took Ara because the Americans requested it. Meher Ara was released home to Canada after 10 months time spent in a coffin-sized cell in solitary confinement. He's never been charged with anything. Dateline caught up with Meher Arar again this week, 
after he'd received the news about the court's decision. When a human being is wronged, the first place he would expect to go is to the justice system. And in my case, that's what I exactly did. And, and I filed a lawsuit two years ago. Um, I, 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 I wanted to hold the people accountable. And all of a sudden, the judge is just saying, you know, good luck. That's, that's what's, you know, scary about it. In his court case against the US government, Ara asked for compensation and a statement that what happened to him was unlawful. Last week, the case was dismissed, largely because of national security and foreign policy considerations. The judge said that he couldn't declare what happened to Ara was illegal because it could threaten the security of America. A judge who declares on his or her own Article III authority that the policy of extraordinary rendition is under all circumstances unconstitutional must acknowledge that such a ruling can have the most serious of consequences to our foreign relations or national security or both. The judge said that such decisions are for the government, not the judiciary. The task of balancing individual rights against national security concerns is one that courts should not undertake without the guidance or the authority of the coordinate branches in whom the Constitution imposes responsibility for our foreign affairs and national security. Those branches have the responsibility to determine whether judicial oversight is appropriate. Iraq's lawyers are shocked by the judgment. Bill Goodman says judicial oversight of government is an essential part of democracy. And this is a principle that goes all the way back to the Magna Carta to at least 1215 to the 13th century uh, and probably well beyond. But if the courts cannot get involved and cannot demand answers from the executive branch and cannot, in, cannot tell the executive branch that it cannot abuse its power, then nobody can. Then we're setting ourselves up for an executive branch which will, which is prepared to, will uh, likely and undoubtedly, in my opinion, will abuse its power. Bill Goodman agrees it's important to consider national security, but not at any cost. I think they have to be taken into consideration in determining whether or not what the government has done is reasonable. But I do not think that they are a trump card and can be played, and as a result, no court can get involved in deciding whether or not someone's rights have been violated. That would be a violation of the most basic and fundamental democratic principles of the American Constitution. This is clearly not the view of the judge, though. He went as far as saying that the judiciary doesn't have the right to hold the government to account over policies like rendition, even if the law is broken. Judges should not, in the absence of explicit direction by Congress, hold officials who carry out such policies liable for damages, even if such conduct violates our treaty obligations or customary international law. The IRA judgment is clearly written in the context of America being in the middle of a so-called war on terror. It frequently cites the importance of national security. IRA's lawyers say this has led the judge to act in fear. Fear of terror, this, you know, fear that there will be another terrorist attack. And that if there is, that these opinions, that the judges will be blamed because they let the terrorists get away with it, because they, they, they tied the hands of the government in fighting the war on terror, which of course this isn't. This is demanding of the government that it do what the Constitution compels it to. For Meher Ira, whose only connection with terrorists is that he was mistaken for one, it's a devastating blow. So you have to understand the context in which uh, all this happened. You know, I was a successful engineer before. I was uh, living a normal life. Uh, I've, I've, I had everything I wanted, you know. And all of a sudden, I am without a job. I'm still, uh, I still have scars, mostly psychological scars. And I'm still with the nightmares. I'm still with suffering from psychological uh, effects. Um, and financially, I have... Uh, it's it's very very uh, you know uh, bad situation, and that's what's disappointing about this. Not only like it's giving the Bush administration the green light to continue in their evil practice, 
but also it's it's very destructive for me on the personal level.